This is part two of a message entitled the uh, just a minute here. Get my paperwork right. The true gift of Christmas. The true gift of Christmas. This is part two of a message entitled the true gift of Christmas. We began this message um, concerning the birth of Christ and what that means for a Bible believing Christian. And in that message, we started off by talking about the things that the uh, Word of God says about Jesus Christ and the importance of His gift and uh, what that gift should mean to you as a born-again believer. Now, people in the world, when they look at Christmas, they look at it uh, from a commercial aspect. Everything uh, is attached to a dollar uh, symbol, and people look at Christmas as a means to an end to get their pocketbooks and their bank accounts fatter. And for the average American today, they, they view Christmas as, what are you doing for me today? What are you giving me? What kind of gift am I getting? Is it going to be something that I like? Is it going to be something that I need to turn back in? And very few Americans today, if they would be honest, think about the birth of Christ at Christmas. They may make a passing reference to it, but they really don't meditate upon the, um, <clears throat> the importance of the birth of Christ and why Jesus came and what that does for uh, us and what God did for us in Christmas. Um, but you need to understand that God gives us eternal life by giving us His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We talked about that in the last part of this message. Now, today I want to continue that by looking at Luke twenty-two nineteen. 19. Uh, this ought to be familiar to you if you uh, partake in the communion service. Uh, verse 19, the Bible says, He took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. So the next thing we need to talk about today is that Jesus Christ gave his body to the believer. Remember, Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ was more than just a man. He was more than just a prophet. He was more than just a miracle worker. He was more than just a great you know, philosopher. Uh, as a matter of fact, he wasn't a philosopher at all. He was God manifest in the flesh. And if you don't believe that, then you don't believe the Holy Scriptures. Because the Holy Scriptures reveal Jesus Christ to be God manifest in the flesh. Take your Bible and look at 1 Timothy 3.16. And you'll see that made uh, very clear. Now, if you've got a new Bible, uh, when I say new Bible, I'm talking about the NIV, New American Standard, ESV, the message, the, the voice. Um, or any other combination of new translations that are on the market today, this verse will be tampered with and the uh, doctrinal thing on this will be taken out. But if you've got a King James Bible, it says this in John, uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. It says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. He had to come and die for our sins. Why? Because we offended God by our sins. And the one that we have been, uh, the one that we offended is the one that we have to be reconciled to. Now, there's some more scriptures on this. Look at 1 Timothy, uh, excuse me, 1 John 3, 16. 1 John 3, 16. He'll say it again. Uh, 1 John 3, 16. Look at those 3, 16s in your Bible real carefully when you come across them. Most of the time, there's some uh, very important doctrinal truths found in these 3, 16s. Here's another example. In 1 John 3, 16, it says... Um, Excuse me. <clears throat> Hereby perceive we the love of God. Again, this one's been tampered with in the new Bibles. God is taken out because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, in this passage, it makes it very clear who laid down his life for us. It was God. 
The life that was flowing through the body of Jesus Christ was eternal life, and that life was God's life. And he laid that life down so that we could have eternal life through him. All right, let's look at uh, Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. Uh, prophecy concerning Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Isaiah seven fourteen. The Bible says this in verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And the word Emmanuel means uh, God with us. God with us. Uh, you see that in Matthew chapter 1. He gives you the translation of what that means. Look at Matthew chapter 1. And we'll read that one real quick. Matthew 1. And look over here at verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God with us. Now, again, I told you earlier that uh, the one that you have offended is the one that you have to be reconciled to. And if you want to see a passage connected to that in the New Testament, go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. And look at verse, uh, chapter 5, rather. I think it's chapter 5, let's see. Chapter 5. And look down here. Actually, it might be 2 Corinthians. I'm sorry, I misspoke. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. And we're going to look down here at verse uh, 19. The Bible says to wit, and that means to know or to understand, that God was in Christ reconciling, there's that word reconcile, the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So when we're out preaching the gospel, and we're out winning people to Jesus Christ, one of the, the biblical truths that you need to let them know and understand is that what we're bringing them back in reconciliation to is God, and Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. When we're reconciling them to God, they have to be reconciled through Jesus Christ because he is God manifest in the flesh. And one of the things that uh, Jesus Christ did for us is he gave his life for us. He gave his body for us. So when Jesus is at the Last Supper and he says, uh, "Take eat, this is my body, what he's doing is he's giving you eternal life through his body. Through his body. Now our Lord stepped into time. He stepped into portals of time and took on flesh to feel what we feel, see what we see, and then take that body and offer it up as a sacrifice for our sins forever. Take your Bible and look at Hebrews. This body becomes very important in our reconciliation. Hebrews chapter 9 and look at verse 28. This is the story of Christmas. This is what Christmas is about for us Bible-believing Christians. It is about God coming into time, stepping into a mortal body, and offering that body up as a sacrifice for our sins. Hebrews 9.28. Look at verse 28. The Bible says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin and salvation. Go to Hebrews 10.10. 10. The Bible says, By the which will, that means testament, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. Look at verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Look at verse 14. The Bible says in verse 14, for by one offering hath he perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, when you put all these together, there's a couple of things that you need to notice here. One of the things you need to uh, uh, notice is it's one offering, one sacrifice. Not many, one. So, we, uh, as Bible-believing Christians, when we come to the communion table, when we come to the table of the Lord, we're not offering up a sacrifice 
or re-sacrificing Jesus Christ on the altar. That's impossible to do. He was offered up one time. So the Roman Catholic teaching that every time you go to Mass, it's a, it's a sacrifice or you're sacrificing the Lord on the altar again. That is a heresy taught by a bunch of people that don't understand the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures make it very clear that it's one offering, one sacrifice that was offered up once and for all for our sins forever at Calvary. What we teach in the communion table and the Lord's table is this. Number one, it is a memorial. Number two, when we uh, do the uh, words of consecration and everything, the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ becomes present. Okay, it becomes present on the altar, but it's not a re-sacrificing of that offering. We don't offer, we don't sacrifice Jesus Christ again. We don't put him on the altar and sacrifice him up to God again. It's the one offering that was sacrificed that becomes spiritually present in our midst and we partake of the Lord spiritually in the Lord's table. That's what we teach here. All right. Now look at the next thing here. Christ's body was broken. That's found in Luke twenty two nineteen. It was broken so our bodies can be made whole. That's one of the things that we need to understand about the gift of Christmas as well. And you say, well, this is something that happened at the crucifixion and and, and that would be an Easter time message, preacher. Well, it is a Easter time message, but at the same time, you can't you can't just um, uh, have one without the other. They are interconnected. In other words, if Jesus hadn't come in the flesh and uh, was born in a manger, then we couldn't have the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you can't have one without the other. They're interconnected. They are one unit. They are one body of beliefs that we need to understand together. So that's why I'm presenting them like this. Christ's body was broken so our bodies can be made whole. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And look at verse uh, 24. 24. 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. Well, that's not it. Hold on. I don't know why I put that one there. Uh, let's see. I think I, I think I meant to be over here. Let's see. Let me look over here. Um, look at verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh, are they not, which, uh, not they which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the altar? What say I then? That the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice, the idols is anything? But I say the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils and not to God. I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. And then let's go down here uh, to, let's see. Let's go down here to verse, um, excuse me, let's go down here to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Now what we were just reading there is God's given a comparison there between two tables. Two types of uh, um, situations where you have two cups. One's the cup of the Lord and one's the cup of devils. One's the blood of Jesus Christ and one's the blood of devils. And you can't be a partaker of both. You have to pick which one you're going to be a part of. And that, that's a good lesson on Christians needing to decide whether they're going to serve Jesus Christ or serve the world. They need to make their mind up whether they're going to be in or out, whether they're going to be right or wrong, or whether they're going to be true or faithful and right, or they're going to be wishy-washy with the world. Now, here's Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says this, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, 
that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now notice there, he's going to change our vile body. The body that you're in right now is not saved. It's purchased, but it's not saved. And this vile body that you live in still gets sick, it still gets old, it still has evil passions, it still has evil desires, it still wants to do everything contrary to the Word of God and the things of God. You have to put it under subjection, you have to put it uh, uh, into submission through the Word of God, you have to crucify this flesh, you have to mortify the deeds of this flesh, and all of these things are there because this body hasn't been saved yet. It's your spirit man that's saved. It's the inner man that is born again. And what God is telling you is that when you get to heaven, when Jesus Christ appears to take you to glory, that foul body that you're living in at the rapture is going to be changed and fashioned like unto his glorious body. So Jesus Christ's body was broken so that our bodies could be made whole through the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying there. That body broken allows us to be placed into the spiritual body of Jesus Christ by the Holy Ghost. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and look at verse 16. 1 Corinthians 10, look at verse 16. In verse 16, the Bible says again, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now, that broken body allows us to be placed into the spiritual body of Jesus Christ by the Holy Ghost. Understand that. We are partakers of the blood of Christ. We are partakers of the body of Christ through the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we'll say it again. Look at verse uh, 13. The Bible says in verse 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, See that thing? We are baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. In other words, every person that gets born again in the body of Christ is placed into the spiritual body of Jesus Christ. That thing was broken at Calvary to open the door for you to get in. That's why his body was broken open. It was his side was split open. And that was a spiritual picture there of opening his spiritual body up so you could get inside that body and be a part of his body. Bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. That's what you need to know. Ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Now, um... Let me see if they give you some. Look at verse 27. The Bible says, And now you are the body of Christ, the members in particular. That's what I was just saying. And look at verse 25. There should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Whether one member suffer, all the members suffer. Uh, or one member be honored, all the uh, members rejoice with it. Now, that's what God's desire is for the body of Christ, that we all speak the same thing. We all walk in unity. We all walk in, in the truth of God's word, the light of God's word. And there be no schisms in the body. There be no divisions in the body. Unfortunately, we live in a uh, world, in a, uh, in a situation with our bodies where our bodies don't want to submit to the truth. So there's going to be things in the body of Christ that aren't right. There's going to be things there that are schisms. There are going to be things there where people are teaching things that are contrary to the truth. And that's why God gave us a Bible. And that's why God gave us the Holy Ghost so we could have discernment. So we can know the difference between what is right and what is wrong, and what is true and what is not true. All right. Now... Christ gave us the gift of life by giving us his blood. Christ gave us the gift of life in the incarnation by giving us his blood. Go to Acts chapter 20. This ought to be familiar to you. Acts chapter 20. Look at verse 28. Verse 28 says this. 
It says in verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of who? God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. That passage right there lets you know that the blood that was flowing through the veins of Jesus Christ was not ordinary blood. He didn't get his blood from Joseph. He didn't get his blood from his mama. He got it from his father, which is God. And it was God's blood that was flowing through the veins of Jesus Christ. That is eternal life that was flowing through the blood of Jesus Christ. That blood is holy. That blood is separate from sinners. And that blood, when you touch it, when you get a hold of it, it'll change you. It'll save you. It'll wash your sins away. And it will have the power to set you free from any bondage that you might be in. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that breaks chains. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that saves sinners from hell. <laughs> Excuse me. And it is the blood of Jesus Christ that keeps you alive and keeps you going. The blood of Jesus Christ. Now go to um, Leviticus. Leviticus. You don't get your eternal life from getting baptized in a pool somewhere. Is baptism important? Absolutely. It's an obedience thing. And it's picturing something. But water baptism don't save you. Now notice I said water baptism. <laughs> you don't get that confused with spirit baptism. Spirit baptism is what puts you in the body of Christ. And it's spirit baptism that puts you in through the blood. When you receive, when you have the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your soul and your garment spiritually, you are white and clean and prepared to enter into the body of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost can get in there and dwell with you and not be contaminated by your sins. Leviticus chapter 17, look at verse 11. The Bible says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to, uh, to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The blood is what makes the atonement. Not church membership. Not keeping the Ten Commandments. Not a bunch of list of do's and don'ts. Not joining the church of your choice. Not getting up at the front of the church and shaking the preacher's hand. Not sitting around and keeping a bunch of rules that you think you can keep when nobody can keep them, including you. You're going to be saved and the atonement is going to be applied to you when you uh, accept and allow the blood of Jesus Christ to come on the inside of you and save you. It's the blood that saves you. You can quit drinking, you can quit smoking, you can quit cussing, you can quit fornicating, you can quit adultery, you can quit all those things and still go to hell. You know why? Because those things don't save you or not save you. What saves you is the blood of Jesus Christ being applied. See? And that's the important thing. Go back to Luke 22. That's why when we take communion, we're pronouncing that we're preaching that actually in the communion service uh when we say the following things because we say this during the communion service look at luke twenty two twenty. look at twenty two twenty of luke when the lord's instituting the last supper he says this in luke twenty two twenty. <clears throat> excuse me he says likewise also the cup after supper saying this cup is the new testament in my blood which is shed for you that blood is shed for you. You got to make it personal, man. You got to make it about you. You got to say, all right, Lord, I need the blood applied to me because I am a lost sinner. All right. Christ's blood is applied to the believer supernaturally when he trusts Jesus Christ as his Savior. This blood supernaturally regenerates us into the sons of God and gives us the gift of eternal life. Go to John chapter 1. And he'll say it there. John chapter 1. And look at verse 12. This is what the blood will do for you when you receive Jesus Christ. The Bible says, but as many as receive him. Well, who's the him? That's Jesus Christ. To them gave he power. 
See, you got to have power to become the son of God. And I don't mean authority. I mean power. I mean something supernatural has to take place that transforms you into a new, a new creature called the son of God. You become a son of God through the new birth. And that's power, supernatural power that changes you and makes you a new creature in Christ Jesus. And that new creature is called a son of God. Look at it again. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, the son of, sons of God, the reason we become sons of God is because we're changed and transformed into the image of Jesus Christ our Lord. And he is the son of God. Look at uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. He'll say it there. Romans chapter 8. Look at this. In Romans chapter 8, look at verse... Um, look at uh, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to what? The image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. There's that image. You're transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, that blood supernaturally regenerates us into the sons of God and gives us the gift of eternal, not conditional, eternal life. In other words, when you get born again and get saved and get washed in the blood of Jesus and receive eternal life, that does not and cannot be undone. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter how you think you can do it, it cannot be undone or else it would not be eternal, everlasting life. It would be conditional. And the Holy Scriptures make it very clear. It's eternal, everlasting life that is given to the person that receives Jesus Christ. That's a great gift, man. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. The Bible says in verse 7, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Notice that in him. You're going to be placed into the body of Jesus Christ. Verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. We get that inheritance as a result of being in Jesus Christ. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Look at verse 13. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, that means down payment money, of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession that will be our physical bodies unto the praise of his glory. Now let's go down to Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You're made nigh by the blood of Christ. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 verse 14. The Bible says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In the Old Testament, God was forgiving people, but he was not clearing them. He was forgiving them, pushing their sins forward to the cross, but he was not clearing those sins. In Christ Jesus, when you come to him and are saved, not only does he forgive those sins, but he clears them. He wipes them all away. He does away with those sins. He does away with them through the blood of his cross. Look in this, verse 20. The Bible says, And having made peace 
through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things in himself by him I say whether there be things in earth or things in heaven and ye who were so times alienated in the enemies in your mind by wicked works yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind the, of the affections, excuse me, of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Notice, he reconciled everything and made peace through the blood of his cross. It's the blood of Christ that brings you to salvation. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that brings you to Calvary and brings you to Jesus Christ and brings you into the body and makes you a new creature. All right, now, um, let's see, there's something else here I wanted to see. Uh, let's see. Looking for another verse here that I saw. Let's see. Go down here to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. The Bible says in verse 13, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was contrary to, uh, was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. A reference to the cross. Again, it's through the blood of Christ that we are brought to the new birth and brought into eternal life, and that eternal life cannot be undone. Hebrews chapter 9, let's look at this one. Hebrews chapter 9. I know um, some of the uh, brethren that have different views on this are going to sit down and say, but what about this and what about that? Just pay attention to the words of the Scriptures. The Bible says here in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead work to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, for a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept, all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats without water, with water rather, and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things by the law, now that's the key word there, by the law, purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in heaven should be purified with these. What are these? The blood. But the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. What's the better sacrifices? The better sacrifices would include the blood of Jesus Christ. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but in the heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. This is where we differ in our theology from the Catholic Church. See, they teach that he's re-offered on the altar, re-sacrificed, uh, in a sense, on that altar. Now, you talk to them and get into a theological conversation with any Roman Catholic priest, they'll argue with you about the semantics of this, but the, the truth of the matter is, every time that they get in that altar and they do their Mass, they say it is the sacrifice of the Mass. 
And that's where we would say, well, then Jesus Christ is suffering again. And the Bible tells you that he is not suffering again. He suffered once, the Bible says, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's one sacrifice. As is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. In Hebrews chapter 13, look at verse uh, 12. Verse 12, the Bible says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the gate, bearing his reproach. But here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Go down to verse uh, 20, and let's continue to read. Verse 20, now the God of peace, which brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And one final place we want to go to on the blood is found in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. Uh, let's go back and get a few uh, verses before that to get some context. Uh, let's go down here to verse uh, 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he who hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now, that's one thing I want you to notice there in verse 15 and 16, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. God is telling you to be something, not do something. He's telling you to be something, not do something. Notice the wording there. He is telling the people, you have to be something in order to live with me. You have to be something in order to dwell in my presence. And that is be holy. And that is something that no human being of their own merit and of their own effort and of their own works can be. They cannot be holy. You cannot of your own effort and own uh, ability become that. It takes a supernatural rebirth to become holy. In other words, if any man is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. Behold, all, th all things, um, old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. But now, in order to be a new creature in Christ Jesus, you have to be born again. That's what Jesus Christ was telling Nicodemus. He said, ye must be born again. You cannot see the kingdom of heaven, excuse me, the kingdom of God. You cannot... Enter the kingdom of God. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And of course, Nicodemus went a different route on that. He, he was listening with the natural ear and he was not understanding what the scripture had revealed in the Old Testament about being born again, even though it was there. Even though there were things there that would let him know as a Jewish leader of the Holy Scriptures, he should have known this. But he's listening with a natural ear and he's looking with a natural eye and he's hearing about a physical rebirth. And it's not a physical rebirth that Jesus Christ is talking about. It is a spiritual rebirth that takes place as a result of the blood atonement of Jesus Christ being applied to the heart and soul. Keep reading. He says here, he says, uh, in verse 16, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. If you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judge according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Now that means that you can't buy your way into heaven. No indulgences can, no indulgences can get you there. No uh, paying uh, for any number of masses can get you there. You cannot pay your way into heaven. It is impossible to do so. You have to be uh, born again 
through the blood atonement of Jesus Christ to get there. The Bible says, uh, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. For who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. If you got your faith and hope in God, then it'll be in the blood of Jesus Christ also. You cannot separate those two things. A person that tells you they believe in God but does not believe in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ is a liar. He is a liar in the fact that he is saying, I believe one thing about God, but I don't believe the other thing that's revealed in the same place. Because when God revealed himself to us, he revealed the fact that he was going to come and die and shed his blood to redeem us. And if you put your faith and hope in God, you put your faith and hope in that as well. Because they're interconnected. All right. The Bible tells us the next thing about the uh, greatest gift about Christmas was it's found wrapped. It was found wrapped. I love this. Uh, it's like that little thing that God put in there to say, okay, you're looking for the presents, you're looking for the gifts. And it's interesting that at Christmas time we wrap gifts and put them under the tree and we put them uh, wherever we put them in our home to let our loved ones get them on uh, Christmas morning. And we wrap those gifts up so that people can get that big surprise when they open that gift up and see what's inside that gift wrapping. Well, guess what? God wrapped up the gift of himself uh, for us to open. Look at Luke chapter 2. Now, I thought this was very, uh, very, very special here. Luke, Luke chapter 2, look at verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. And God offers that gift to you. He offers that gift to me. And he says, here's the greatest gift that I can give you on Christmas morning. Open this gift. It's the gift of my son. It's the gift that keeps on giving. It's the gift that once you receive it, it is something that will give you something that will carry you out into eternity in my presence. The greatest gift was found wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Open this gift today. Open it. Look at Titus chapter 2. Uh, excuse me, chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. I'm glad I opened that gift as a 10-year-old little boy in Kingsville, North Carolina at Calvary Baptist Church when uh, that preacher was preaching that message and, uh, on hell. And, and uh, I didn't understand the Bible then. I didn't understand everything about God and the Bible, but I'll tell you one thing I did understand. I needed Jesus Christ, and I needed, I needed to be saved so I couldn't go to hell, so I wouldn't go to hell. And that preacher led me to Jesus Christ, and uh, I have never been the same since. It, me it messed me up real good. I mean, it saved me. It washed me in the blood. It took away uh, the ability of me being able to go to hell. And I mean, I've made some mistakes since then. I've done some things that I'm not proud of since then. And, and I've failed God uh, miserably at times since then. But I'm going to tell you something. God has always been there with me and inside of me and leading and guiding me. And when I get out of line, he chastises me and corrects me and gets me back on the right path. And sometimes I'm stubborn and I'm hard-headed and, and it takes me a little while to get back where I need to be. But God brings me where I need to be through the word of God and through the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. And I thank God every day that I open that gift and I receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Look at Titus chapter 3 and look at verse 4. The Bible says, But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. There it is, appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to His mercy He saved us. By the washing of regeneration, there's that blood, and renewing of the Holy Ghost, there comes the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Now I want you to notice in verse 6, he uses the term he shed. Notice that getting the Holy Ghost is connected to receiving the blood atonement. The blood that was shed at Calvary. In other words, you can't get the Holy Ghost without receiving the blood of Jesus Christ and allowing that to be applied to your heart. They're interconnected. 
You can't get the Holy Ghost without receiving the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. It's impossible. Because the blood is the avenue and the pathway through which the Holy Ghost comes through. The Holy Ghost cannot touch anything unclean. And the only way that you can be clean is through the blood. And the Holy Ghost comes on the inside of you after God seals that new man off so that the contaminations or sins of the flesh cannot enter into the soul. So he does a spiritual circumcision on you and places you in the body of Jesus Christ. He seals you off and the Holy Ghost comes in there and that's where the Holy Ghost dwells. He does not dwell in the flesh, so to speak. He dwells on the inner man that's on the inside of you. That's where he's at. And if the sins of the flesh could ever touch the soul, the Holy Ghost would leave you and you could lose your salvation. But God, through the New Testament, has made a way for you to be saved, safe, secured, eternally secured forever through the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. That's something that the Old Testament saints could not enjoy. That's something that people before the cross could not enjoy because they could lose their salvation. That's people under the law could not enjoy. They could lose their salvation. That's people in the tribulation period that cannot enjoy because they also can lose their salvation. It's something unique to the church age body of Jesus Christ. When you get saved, God saves you and spiritually circumcises you, places you in the body, makes you a part of his body, makes you a part of his bride, and, and keeps you safe forever. The Bible says here in verse uh, 5, Not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now notice it says there you're justified by his grace. So I'm going to show you something else about that. Go to Romans chapter 5. You're justified there according to that by his grace, right? Well, look at Romans chapter 5 and look at verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his what? Great. Uh, excuse me, his blood. By his blood. So, in other words, you can't have the grace of God without the blood of Jesus Christ being applied. They also are interconnected. When a man says he's saved by grace, he's saying he's saved by the blood. When a man says he's justified by the grace of God, he's in essence saying I'm justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. You can't have one without the other. Verse 9, But it's more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. You're saved from wrath through him. And look at verse 25 of chapter 3. The Bible says in verse 25, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness, for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Notice that we are saved by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, we're, to, we're told to have faith in God. Well, you can't have faith in God without having faith in His blood that He shed for you. So, preacher, what does propitiation mean? It means atonement. It means atoning. It means a victim. It means to appease, placate, to, uh, to um, uh, basically it means an atonement and it appeases a, a person, uh, the, the one offended. So, whom God has set forth to be a appeasement or an atonement through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. All right. It removes the judicial displeasure of God. When applied, it means to turn away the wrath of a righteous God against sin by the acceptance of Christ's death as a satisfactory substitute. That's what it means. All right. In closing, 
Christ has given us so much to be thankful for during the Christmas holiday season. Let us not forget the reason for the season for us and to show our gratitude by giving back and sharing Christ with others. It's a beautiful opportunity, an amazing opportunity for you this time of the year to share Jesus Christ with others. Jesus is the reason for the season for us. And I keep emphasizing for us because there's many out there that he's not the reason for anything. But that should not be you if you're born again. Jesus is the reason for the season and the true gift of Christmas. We should keep Christ in our celebration. Remember that. And that is the true gift of Christmas. God bless you.